Hi, this is James Cook of the University of Maine at Augusta, and I'm recording this video for social science students who are interested in understanding social media and the idea of affordances, uh, one of the most central concepts uh, in the analysis of social media within the academic context. So one of the problems with thinking about affordances over social media is that the parameters of a social media space are in many important ways abstract. They're not physical. So it helps to think of the analogy of the physical space you're in and to think about uh, uh, the affordances of that space and then think about how we might think similarly about online spaces. The reason that these are called spaces is that um, the analogy is that there are in spaces uh, freedoms that are allowed, the freedom to move, the freedom to do, the freedom to um, sense and see and interact with an environment. And there are also limitations, things that are not possible to do, uh, to see, to experience, um, or ways to interact. So, thinking about affordances in that way, what are the affordances of the room I'm in right now? Well, you can see a few of these affordances already. Well, look above my head. You see a light. <laughs> the exp ex existence of light in a room should not be underestimated. We just assume that it will be there until it's not, until there's a power outage, or until perhaps we're stuck in a place where um, the, there is no light of day, there is no uh, window to provide a light, or uh, there is no uh, uh, overhead light that allows us to then pick up a book and read it and learn from it. Uh, we only notice it perhaps when it's gone. But it's an essential aspect of uh, this room, which is an academic office room, that it uh, permits us to read through light. It also permits us to store the books that we read with a ceiling. Ceilings are so important and, and we forget about them until things happen like perhaps we have a, uh, a really cold weekend like we do often up here in Maine in the winter that freezes pipes and bursts them at which point the ceilings if there's a, a pipe overhead uh, they, they rot and they fall in on us and we no longer can rely on them. At which point we realize we are not protected from the elements anymore. Our, our books are ruined. We cannot read them anymore. And then all of a sudden we're very upset because the things we expect to be able to do, we are no longer able to do. Um, so the affordance of a ceiling uh, is first that it protects us from the elements, and second, it uh, protects us from whatever's up there. Um, and just like a floor allows us not only to enter the room and continue to walk on the room without falling through, a really important prerequisite, right? That's a very basic affordance, a standing, but it prevents me from having to interact with people below me in a floor. The same thing that walls do as well. Walls um, uh, not only draw a frame around a room and say, this is this room and that is not this room, but um, allow a conversation to occur over there, or over there, and uh, a third conversation to occur here um, and, and not in the same place. Okay, so, but, uh, oh look, another affordance, uh, the clock. It allows me to uh, <laughs> know when I have to head to go out and teach a class, right? Um, <laughs> but there are some limitations as well, right? So the, this, the dimensions of the room, this office, are small enough that I could only fit a few people in here to have discussions with me. Um, it, we could look and see how many chairs are there. There are two 
chairs in this room. The chairs allow us to get comfortable and have a, a nice long conversation for a while, but um, <laughs> certainly don't allow a whole class to be taught in here. And that's really important to note as an affordance. Affordances limit uh, as much as they enable, they constrain as well. So the affordance of this room is for small conversations. You might be able to have a third person stand in this room, maybe, so to have a three-way conversation, but that's, it's not what this room is designed for. It's designed for two at best. Um, and it's uh, uh, therefore not a classroom. Um, the, the interaction that could occur here is not uh, one in which there are 30 students, undergraduate students, in a classroom interacting with me as a professor. Um, until I notice the existence of this computer. Now this computer here with two monitors is uh, part of the setup of this office, uh, which I'm borrowing today. And if I can log in, uh, another affordance of the computer as a physical object in the room, if it has the software that allows me to log into my university account, then, and I, oh, and if that computer ha is connected via an ethernet cable, another aspect of this room, uh, to uh, uh, the internet, then I am uh, able to interact electronically with as many people as I can imagine. So that computer over there is a really, really essential aspect of this room. It affords me the freedom to walk in here and within five minutes be able to start to interact with others. There's more here. There's a, there's a desk, which uh, combined with the uh, existence of a pen and some paper, it allows me to write in this room. It's really difficult to write without a desk. It's a flat surface on which, so sure, there can be a computer, there could be a phone and things like that, but also a space for me to write. Uh, maybe to edit a student's work, maybe to write notes on, on a review of a, a research article that I'm working on, maybe a space for me to write my own materials. That's an affordance of the space. Now, one more affordance of this space that we can see here is a door. This is n not an unimportant affordance. It's, it provides me, it affords me with the ability to leave this room and also to enter this room, at which point we uh, can start to think about what's outside of this room. This room is on the fourth floor of a building. And that means that there are issues of accessibility affordances. Um, what modes of uh, ascent to the fourth floor are there? Well, there's a set of stairs. So does that afford everybody to be able to get to the fourth floor? Not by itself, which is why in order to be ADA compliant, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act compliant, this building also has an elevator to provide an, an alternative uh, means for people to get to the fourth floor in the first place. So that's a form of an affordance that you can't see in the room itself, but in the context of what surrounds this room. Similarly, we can think about um, accessibility issues for social media platforms. What um, primary uh, affordances are there to allow people to use a social media platform? And what secondary means are there to allow people who can't use those primary means to find another way to interact with the social media environment? Uh, in general, we should be looking, when we're looking at social media platforms for analogs to something like a room. Uh, what are the ways in? What are the ways out? What are the modes of interaction that are possible and impossible on a platform? 
Uh, what are the modes of individual action, the types of individual action that a person can engage in? Is there the equivalent of a desk for someone to write? Uh, is there the equivalent of a pen, the, which provides the, someone the ability to record? Um, or are these um, affordances stripped out of a social media platform in order to render it, render it uh, permanent or impermanent uh, in, in terms of what goes on there? Uh, if you have trouble thinking about what affordances do and how they work, think about the um, analogy of a room and look for aspects of a social media platform that allow you to do the same things you would do in a room. Look at the structure around the platform and look at the structure of the platform itself and think what's possible here what's impossible? The answer to that question points you in the direction of affordances.